And a very early good morning to folks in, in Asia. This is ISI's Game Changers seminar series in which we will look at uh, missions that have changed the game in planetary sciences. We will look at astronomy and astrophysics later in the year, so in, in, in November, December, but uh, in this period, we're focusing on planetary science missions. I'm Tuman Schoen, and I'm your host today, as I was uh, last week. But today, we will have Dr. Alan Stern speak about the New Horizons mission to the pluto Charon system and the Kuiper Belt. Uh, Alan served as the PI and the mastermind of the mission, that's how I understand it, uh, and the lead of the science team. And with that, I hand over to you, Alan, uh, not taking much more of your time. Go ahead. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Tillman. Thank you for the introduction this morning, but thank you for the invitation uh, to give this presentation uh, in this fantastic series. Uh, I'm going to give a very top level general scientific overview of some of the game changing results from the New Horizons mission to what we call the third zone of our solar system. Uh, the, the terrestrial planets being the first zone and the giant planets being the second zone and then the Kuiper belt where Pluto orbits being uh, the third zone and I hope to finish in about 45 minutes and then have time for your questions. Uh, and let me say, uh, you call me the mastermind of the mission. Um, I'm quite embarrassed by that. Um, New Horizons is a very large team. Over 2,500 men and women worked on this project. Um, most of them not scientists, but even the scientific team uh, numbers more than 200. And the results that I'm gonna present, although primarily focused on results by our team, uh, uh, the data has been worked on by people on virtually every continent. There are very important contributions that I will speak about from Europeans, uh, obviously North Americans from Asian, uh, and, and even people uh, in Australia, New Zealand, and South America um, who have uh, been a part of the interpretation and understanding of these beautiful data sets. Uh, so it's really quite a team effort uh, and a human effort. And with that, um, I'll get underway. And let me start with a little context. I know there's a wide variety of people uh, from various fields, not just planetary science or even planetary science and astronomy, but from the earth sciences, for example, and from heliophysics. And so I just want to remind everyone uh, that uh, this all started because Pluto was discovered in a search for a new planet that had been going on for decades since approximately uh, 1900. Pluto was discovered in 1930 in these images uh, made at Lowell Observatory by uh, a very young astronomer named Clyde Tombaugh uh, and uh, uh, was immediately recognized um, as a very important object, uh, ninth planet in the solar system. Uh, but the technology of the early 20th century and even the mid 20th century was too primitive to really understand Pluto at all. Uh, when I first became interested in science and read books uh, uh, it, written in the 1960s and 1970s, you often saw tables like this one about the planets proceeding left to right from the closest to the sun with Mercury all the way out to Neptune and Pluto. And when you get to Pluto, it was all question marks because we weren't able to resolve it uh, as anything other than a point of light uh, in the 1960s and until really the late 1970s, there were no uh, uh, substantial capabilities to make spectroscopy. Uh, and many of the techniques that we could apply today, uh, uh, just w we didn't have those capabilities, but we were inventing spaceflight. And spaceflight, of course, is the transformative tool of planetary science that has allowed us to uh, go beyond our telescopic capabilities and to go close to uh, the primary targets and, and also uh, uh, the minor bodies in the solar system, to see them in great detail, to sample their atmospheres in situ, their surfaces in situ, et cetera. Um, uh, let me just illustrate this point. This is the best image of Pluto ever made before New Horizons arrived for a flyby in 2015. And 
it's pitifully in, inadequate for scientific analysis. Although I was the PI of this program that obtained this image uh, in the 1990s using the Hubble Space Telescope shortly after the optical repair of a telescope. Um, and this was the first resolved image of Pluto and it allowed us, and there were many others like it, by the way, as Pluto rotated on its axis over a period of uh, almost a week, uh, that allowed us to determine that Pluto's surface was highly variegated, uh, that there was a wide variety of, of albedo units, uh, et cetera. And in the 1980s and 90s, other tools, including uh, uh, spectroscopy, uh, and uh, the results of mutual events allowed us to determine many things about the Pluto system. Uh, we learned that Pluto had an atmosphere, has an atmosphere. Uh, we learned something about its vertical structure. We were able to conjecture about its escape rate. Uh, we were able to image the surfaces I show you here uh, to learn some crude things about the albedo plant patterns on Pluto's largest satellite called Charon, which was discovered uh, in 1978 uh, and which turns out to be half the diameter of Pluto. Uh, the two constitute a true double planet with a berry center, not inside the primary, but between the two bodies, much like a binary star. And as we now know, much like many binary asteroids, uh, although they're much smaller. Uh, I'll speak to that in a little bit. But the tools of the 80s and the 90s allowed us to discover that Pluto's surface is heterogeneous in its color, in its albedo distribution, in its composition from place to place, and to learn that its satellite is highly dichotomous. That is, that uh, uh, Charon, the large satellite, has a different surface composition, a different reflectivity, a different color, um, and so forth. All of these things intrigued us very much uh, and uh, started an effort uh, following the spectacular flyby of Neptune and Triton uh, by Voyager uh, to mount a spacecraft mission to reconnoiter the Pluto system. This effort began uh, in 1989, and the first study funded by NASA was completed in 1990. But in fact, it took a whole series of studies of different kinds of concepts. Uh, uh, there were some attempts to get funding. It didn't work out. In the end, finally, in 2001, uh, our mission, New Horizons, was selected after a competitive process that NASA ran uh, to, to build and fly a single spacecraft, uh, not two like the Voyagers, but a single spacecraft all the way across the solar system to this third zone. And um, I should say that of all the things that we learned in what I will call the astronomical era before New Horizons, a spacecraft arrived, the most perplexing, I think, really uh, for all of the wonderful problems that we anticipated scientifically, the most perplexing um, uh, relates to our view then of the architecture of our solar system. And even as scientists, all of us, I think, remember learning as school children that the solar system consists of the four rocky, high-density terrestrial planets close to the sun, surrounded by an asteroid belt, uh, and then four gargantuan giant planets, uh, two gas giants, two ice giants. And then there's Pluto, um, which didn't fit either pattern, not a terrestrial planet, not a giant planet, which looked like an oddball, but in fact was really a forensic clue uh, to the true uh, architecture and in fact population structure of our solar system. But we didn't know it in the mid 20th century. Um, it turns out though that Pluto is the biggest, the brightest, and therefore the most easily detected of uh, a much larger population of bodies. Uh, it was detected first, uh, uh, probably entirely because it's the brightest. Um, but beginning in the early 1990s, a whole population called the Kuiper Belt was discovered. And I think the music is a little annoying, but you can see the dots appearing beyond the orbits of the giant planets shown here. These are actual Kuiper Belt objects being discovered in observing runs during the 1990s. The larger ones being shown as larger dots or uh, substantial bodies. And this structure called the Kuiper Belt or Kuiper Disk um, constitutes what I've called the third zone of the solar system. 
It is a three-dimensional structure that is teeming with small bodies and which is also importantly littered with small planets of which Pluto is the icon. Uh, but Pluto is not alone. A whole variety of these small planets have been discovered in this third zone. And you see on the left, some of them shown to scale with approximately correct colors uh, and approximately correct sizes. Uh, Eris is a little smaller than Pluto. It's, Pluto and Eris are very much akin to the Earth, which is only slightly larger than Venus, uh, the next smallest of the terrestrial planets. And you see Makimake and Haumea and Sedna and Quowar and a variety of others on the right. And you see the largest asteroids uh, shown to scale series, for example, another dwarf planet. Um, this really revolutionized our understanding of our solar system, not just its, its architecture. And that what we thought was a two zone solar system with an oddball called Pluto is really a three zone solar system, but it also revolutionized our understanding of the population structure of the solar system by telling us there was an important third class of planets, the dwarf planets. Uh, and in fact, uh, at the time that these discoveries were being made, uh, we in the United States were conducting our first uh, decadal survey to set priorities for the exploration of the solar system at the very beginning of, of this new century. And uh, in fact, because of the discovery of the Kuiper belt, and the discovery of the population of cohorts to Pluto uh, that you see here and others, uh, the exploration of Pluto uh, rocketed to the top of the priority queue, uh, not just for the value of studying the Pluto system itself, but also the value of ex using that uh, to extend our knowledge of the Kuiper belt and particularly dwarf planets. And so New Horizons was selected after a competition, as I said before, it became funded because of this decadal survey, which dis dispatched us to study the Pluto system and to go on into the Kuiper belt and study small bodies in the Kuiper belt, the, the, the seeds of accretion for uh, these dwarf planets. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up now the, uh, the introductory portion of this talk, the context, by telling you that we launched New Horizons in January of 2006 and flew it uh, to a Jupiter gravity assist flyby in 2007 and then on across the enormous expanse of the second zone of our solar system, the giant planet region, to intercept Pluto as it crossed uh, uh, the plane of the solar system in the summer of 2015 and then uh, to go on to Kuiper Belt exploration. And actually this chart is out of date because the Kuiper Belt extends quite a bit beyond uh, what is shown here. Uh, we will continue studying the Kuiper Belt the next couple of years. And if we receive funding for another extended mission, we will continue exploring the Kuiper Belt for many years across this decade at least. The spacecraft itself uh, is very small. It was built to be small so that we could launch it at a high speed to cross the solar system quickly. Uh, the, the dish, the high gain antenna that you see at the top of the spacecraft is only 2.3 meters in diameter, but that provides a good scale. Uh, to the right of the dish, you can see a cylindrical device with blades on it. That's uh, an RTG or radioisotope thermoelectric generator. It's the power source for the spacecraft, uh, which is uh, essentially the passive decay uh, 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 of radioactivity in plutonium, which is encased in the cylinder. And uh, we, we convert a small fraction of the heat from that radioactive decay into DC electricity to run the spacecraft systems. There are seven scientific instruments aboard the spacecraft. You see their names there. I won't go through these in detail. I want to get to results, but let me just say that there's a remote sensing suite with panchromatic cameras of various focal lengths, uh, multicolor cameras, uh, an infrared mapping spectrometer for composition, an ultraviolet spectrometer for studying the composition uh, and vertical structure of Pluto's atmosphere, 
There are two plasma spectrometers, a low energy device called SWAP and a high energy device called Pepsi. There, there's a radio science receiver on board uh, that is used to determine the temperature pressure structure of Pluto's atmosphere, measure its brightness temperature, uh, and do other science. And then a student experiment uh, to count uh, dust particle impacts and to measure their masses uh, as a function of time in a transect of the solar system. So that's the payload. I think for many of you who have worked on spaceflight missions or other big projects, you know that after working on a project for a long time, to see it funded and then designed and built and tested and launched, and in our case, to fly it for a decade to reach our first uh, uh, planned target, Pluto, uh, it's just amazing when it works out, uh, particularly when you only have one spacecraft and one try at making it work out in a flyby mode, not an orbiter where you can recover day to day if, if something is lost. Um, this flyby of the Pluto system, although it, it actually technically lasted six months, um, almost all of the science came in a period barely longer than 48 hours um, when we were very close to the planet and its satellites. And this is actually the first uh, modestly high resolution image that was returned to the Earth um, at the moment that it was first projected on a large screen in front of the science team. This is a candid photo of the science, some members of our science team uh, when we first knew Pluto. Um, but as I said earlier, uh, uh, Pluto was discovered in the late 1970s to actually be a binary planet. These are much better images, although the color here is exaggerated to show better contrast. Um, this is the binary planet pair with Pluto in the foreground, Sharon in the background. You can see their dichotomous nature uh, on immediately. Um, the sizes are, are a little deceptive. Sharon is about 1,200 kilometers across. Pluto is just uh, one or two percent smaller than 2,400 kilometers across, about two to one in size ratio, about an order of magnitude different in mass. Um, as we have learned, their densities are quite similar. Sharon is only very slightly less dense than Pluto. But you immediately notice that Pluto's surface is much more complex and variegated. You can see its higher albedo reflectivity. Um, I'll say more about both bodies, but I'm going to concentrate on Pluto and then we're going to talk about our Kuiper Belt object. Uh, and I am going to say very little about uh, Sharon. Uh, but I do want to say that the New Horizons team, uh, using the Hubble Space Telescope, was able to discover before the flyby that Pluto the pluto sharon system, the binary pair, um, uh, is accompanied by four small satellites, which you see here in images made during our flyby, um, in order of their distance from the binary, and shown to scale with Sharon at the bottom of the upper image, are Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra, those four satellites, two very small and two somewhat larger, um, uh, the, the largest pair, the Hydra and Nix, are uh, something like 40 kilometers in scale. They're all irregularly shaped. They all orbit in the plane of the pluto sharon system. Uh, I unfortunately won't have time to talk about these bodies at all, but I'm happy to uh, have questions about that, of course. Um, and regarding Sharon, it's very reminiscent of the icy satellites of the giant planets in terms of its geology. It has no detectable atmosphere. Um, at uh, levels down to pico bars that we were able to constrain by New Horizons. Its surface is primarily water ice. You can see immediately uh, numerous impact craters. The surface has been age dated at four and a half billion years old. Uh, we don't find any younger units on the surface. We do see this very important red polar stain, uh, which I can speak to later, but I won't have time to go into detail about here. Uh, you can see evidence of tectonics, uh, and there are many other interesting aspects to Sharon's geology that unfortunately I won't have time uh, 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 to explain or even describe, uh, but happy to speak about. Uh, I want to concentrate on the central body Pluto, shown here with a scale bar uh, and its um, precise diameter uh, to the left and shown in true color as your eyes would, would uh, perceive it. Uh, the red 
uh, tinge to the color is due to uh, organic materials, primarily folins, which are created either by radiolysis or by the silting out of um, our particulates from the atmosphere. I'll say more about that. I'll speak more to some examples of the surface geology. Uh, uh, but I want to start with the first of what Tillman asked me to do, and that's talk about the really big findings that come out of this. And the first was the astounding complexity and diversity of phenomenology that we found. For those of you who are not planetary scientists, um, a, there's a good first order correlation uh, with size uh, that the larger objects are, uh, generally the more complex they are. So that the, the planets are more complex than the small bodies in many ways. This is just uh, a statement of fact, not a statement of our degree of interest, of course. Um, but Pluto uh, really is, uh, 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 really broke that mold in many ways. Um, I would like to start to speak about this, this amazing complexity by showing you some imagery made, some high resolution imagery made in, uh, over Pluto's surface that are, we have created into uh, a kind of a, a, a flyover so that you can just get a feeling. We're gonna uh, zoom in near Pluto's North Pole at the top and then fly uh, down south across those polar terrains, uh, many of which are elevated as you will see, uh, and then down onto this large heart-shaped feature uh, onto the, the western side of it, uh, which is a very large glacier named Sputnik Planitia, about a million square kilometers of nitrogen ice uh, also carbon monoxide and methane ice, but uh, let me just uh, walk you through this. So we're going to zoom up on the north northern polar terrains. Um, this is the path that we will fly, beginning on the horizon at the north. Uh, this is, all these terrains are, um, of course, ice covered. You can see craters, you can see structure beneath the surface. Uh, you can see a variety of enigmatic linear features uh, in that image. And then we come up on uh, highland terrain, first uh, kind of badlands, and then more and more complex mountainous terrain uh, with some very interesting color and albedo structure. This is panchromatic. And then off onto the shoreline across the glacier, which has dune fields across its surface. Uh, you can see some large uh, uh, geologic cells as we move across that uh, terrain. The entire transect that we just did is a couple of thousand kilometers. Uh, I'm going to show you much more about Pluto, and I'm going to start with this image made shortly after the New Horizons flyby, uh, which is made actually, uh, the geometry allows us to see the atmosphere of Pluto in forward scattering, which is sensitive to particulates. So you immediately not just recognize that you can see the atmosphere, but you see that it is very finely structured with literally dozens of haze layers that are coherent over large scales from the left to the right. We're looking at a scale of more than a thousand kilometers. Those haze layers extend uh, to hundreds of kilometers in the sky and they are created photochemically by the interaction of ultraviolet sunlight with the nitrogen, carbon monoxide and methane that are the uh, primary and primary trace constituents of Pluto's atmosphere. Uh, you can also see in the surface um, uh, quite a bit of a topographic variation. Uh, the large glacier Sputnik that I spoke to earlier uh, is here where my cursor is. Uh, uh, but you can also see highland terrain and very steep rugged terrain uh, with uh, altitudes of kilometers above the mean datum. Uh, there are many kinds of structures here ranging from, ranging from things that we believe are cryovolcanic that I'll speak to later, uh, to water mountain ice ranges, uh, to uh, crater fields. I'll speak to all of this in the next few minutes, but I think this image typifies the diversity and complexity of this small planet. I am not going to have time to speak to the many discoveries that have been made about Pluto's atmosphere, um, but I'll just whet your appetite by saying that these coherent haze layers, which were not anticipated, there was some discussion about haze layers 
about haze possibly being constituent of the atmosphere, but not structured layered hazes, um, uh, may be the result of a process that we know in the Earth's atmosphere, uh, uh, the creation of gravity waves, of, in this case, likely by orography, uh, that can organize uh, these many regular haze layers. Uh, I want to speak more to uh, the glacier, which is the most prominent single feature on the hemisphere of Pluto that New Horizons flew past in its flyby. Um, and I have to tell you, um, prior to the flyby, we made many predictions. We tried to anticipate the types of science that we would uh, 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 need to have expertise in. Uh, we completely missed the boat uh, in that we hired no glaciologists on the team. We did not expect to find glaciers. Uh, and yet, uh, as I said, this is the most prominent feature on the surface, about a million square kilometers uh, uh, of this enormous feature, which actually sits in a giant impact basin, uh, which was created by a titanic impact on the surface uh, with another object from the Kuiper Belt, perhaps 100 or 200 kilometers across, uh, which very likely raised the mountain ranges around the circumference of that basin. But the basin was then infilled with these volatiles uh, from elsewhere on the surface and, uh, and probably from the interior uh, by volatile transport through Pluto's atmosphere. The, the glacier itself is highly complex. You saw in the transect imagery, the, the flyover video that I showed, um, some evidence of the cellular nature um, of the, the, the structure that we see across the basin. Uh, that has been interpreted first by Bill McKinnon on our team and then by others um, as uh, the signature of uh, a, a convective overturning of the surface of the glacier due to some heat source um, some, some temperature gradient across the ice uh, with depth, uh, which uh, renews the glacier on a regular, regular basis with overturning times that are very short compared to Pluto's age, four and a half billion years old. The overturning, overturning times are of order a million years, give or take a factor of a few. Uh, I'll say more about that in a little bit. Uh, there is an endless, uh, uh, almost endless uh, uh, story that we could tell about the glacier, its structure, its dynamics, its composition, its formation, uh, its important, the importance of this impact basin for shaping other parts of the geology of Pluto. Unfortunately, I won't have time to do more than just assert that uh, and show you a couple of examples. Here are, for example, uh, at the northern boundary against uh, mountain ranges that are characteristically three to five kilometers in altitude above the basin, as I said before, probably raised by the basin impact. Um, we can see evidence of uh, lateral dynamics uh, uh, flows in the glacier, uh, which may include subduction under the mountain ranges. Uh, and you can see the polygonal cells of the, uh, uh, the convection pattern as well. I'll show that in better detail very shortly. I will point out there are there, um, there's uh, ev other evidence of dynamics in the glacier. Here, this is a topographically colored image where the reds and the yellows are the highest altitudes and the, the purples and the blues are the lowest altitudes, uh, ranging over a complete span of about uh, uh, 10 kilometers. Uh, here we see in this uh, mountain range um, uh, a chute uh, where apparently uh, an avalanche or some, some uh, discrete event has uh, poured out uh, uh, fresh ice into the glacier in about a 50 kilometer wide zone uh, uh, down uh, at the bottom of the trough. Uh, we also see evidence that the mountain ranges on the eastern margin of Sputnik are calving that is that they, the uh, ice is breaking off and flowing out into the glacier. Now, we know from spectroscopy and from indirect arguments that the, although the glacier is made of these extremely volatile ices like nitrogen and carbon monoxide and methane, that the mountain ranges are actually made of water ice and uh, then frosted uh, through um, 
uh, atmospheric transport with these more volatile ices. But the water ice is a less dense material than the, the nitrogen. And so when the, when the mountains calve uh, and, and shed blocks uh, into the glacier, because they are lower density, they're buoyant in the glacier, and we actually see these, these clusters of hills, uh, the products of that calving process, um, entrained out into the glacial ice for hundreds of kilometers. In the southern portions of the glacier, we see, another kind, we see other kinds of dynamics. You can see what evidently look like flow patterns. Uh, these features that you see uh, with the uh, uh, leftward uh, bright uh, pixels and the darker pixels to the right are actually pits in the glacier uh, with characteristic sizes of one to several kilometers and characteristic depths of hundreds of meters uh, that may be caused by sublimation or some other process, but which are very common across uh, the southern clines of a glacier. Um, elsewhere on the planet, we see many other kinds of terrains, uh, and I'm going to illustrate that diversity in a few ways. Um, here to the west of Sputnik, um, about a thousand kilometers, we see dissected terrains uh, with uh, uh, broad, uh, coherent uh, tectonic structures, probably related to the formation and loading of the basin subsequently to, subsequent to its formation, the loading of the basin by all of the, the uh, glacial material that now fills it. Uh, and you see many craters here with these bright halos of uh, uh, primarily methane ice uh, uh, that, that either form or are the last remnants of a broader uh, ice accumulation. Uh, that are driven by Pluto's uh, seasonal cycles and actually meta mega seasonal cycles, which I won't have time to describe, that are driven by um, Pluto's obliquity cycles that are very much like terrestrial Milankovitch cycles. Here's another example of uh, diversity on Pluto's surface. Um, near the eastern uh, uh, margins of the flyby hemisphere, we found hundreds of kilometers of terrain uh, that we call snakeskin or bladed terrains that consist of uh, blades very much like the flat irons in the city of Boulder. But they're not, these, these are ice uh, blades stretching perhaps a kilometer in altitude um, up above the, the, the mounded hilly terrain that they sit on. They're at high altitude, they're made of methane uh, and uh, are very likely the result of uh, methane depositing from the atmosphere onto these high altitude terrains because methane is uh, uh, preferentially capable of doing that and nitrogen is not um, at a high altitude owing to the temperature structure of Pluto's atmosphere. As it turns out, this terrain that was uh, only glimpsed on the eastern margin of the flyby hemisphere um, is seen in low resolution across Pluto's so-called far side. And this type of terrain, this bladed terrain, appears to be uh, very common across the equatorial regions of the far side of Pluto, in addition to this, uh, this place on the near side. We have a variety of kinds of evidence that show us that Pluto's surface um, has uh, very likely undergone uh, various styles of cryovulcanism. Uh, the features that I'm showing here uh, may be constructional uh, uh, volcanic uh, features. Uh, the largest of these has a diameter of about 150 kilometers uh, and is many kilometers in altitude with a central pit, which may or may not be a caldera um, that itself is quite deep. And we know all of this from stereo imaging that allows us to recover the topography across the surface. This is in fact a volcanic or appears to be a volcanic province, but it's not the only style of volcanism seen on the surface. In fact, there are um, other evidence uh, for flows and eruptive volcanism on Pluto's surface. Um, there's also quite surprisingly what appears to be a, uh, a frozen lake made of nitrogen in a hanging valley in uh, a mountainous region just to the west of the large glacier Sputnik. This feature is about 30 kilometers in length 
Uh, it does sit at a topographic low. Um, it does have a very distinct shoreline. Uh, as I said, it's made of nitrogen. And if it is in fact a frozen lake as it appears to be, um, it tells us something very important forensically. And that is uh, that Pluto must have had in its past a much higher uh, uh, pressure atmosphere than it currently does because currently uh, we're below the triple point of nitrogen. Uh, Pluto's atmospheric pressure is only about 10 microbars. Uh, that's about 10 to the minus five of one bar and uh, just can't support liquids on the surface. So this is forensic evidence, if you will, if it is in fact a, a nitrogen lake that is frozen out of uh, much higher peri periods of much higher uh, atmospheric pressure in the distant past. I wanna talk about um, diversity and ongoing geologic activity for just a bit. One of the other surprises about uh, Pluto's surface is that we see a wide range of surface ages. It was widely expected uh, that because Pluto is not in a giant planet system uh, and uh, has no um, tidal energy exchange that can currently create geologic activity, that all the geology, apart from whatever is driven by atmospheric transport um, as a frosting on the surface, all the geology would be ancient. And in fact, this terrain, this very heavily cratered terrain, is a testament that there are very ancient terrains that can be age dated from impact or flux models to be four plus billion years old. Uh, but there are also very young terrains. Here on Sputnik Glacier, um, you see no craters whatsoever, which is a testament to the youth of, of these terrains. In fact, across that entire million square kilometers, uh, we have not found a single crater and a single structure that we can confidently identify as a crater on the surface and which allows us to place an upper limit age of on this surface of perhaps uh, 10 or some tens of millions of years old. And as I said earlier, the modeling of the convective activity indicates an overturning age that's only of order a million years, which is consistent with uh, these findings. Uh, you can see here the distribution of craters that have been cataloged across Pluto's surface. The purple zone is the so-called far side where we don't have the resolution to pick out craters in large numbers, only the very largest and rarest craters can be seen there because of the lower resolution. But even on the approach hemisphere, you can see that the surface is heterogeneous in terms of its crater density, and therefore it must be heterogeneous in terms of its age. And very careful work by members of our team has been able to recover um, ages. I spoke to some of those uh, ancient terrains that are 4 billion years old, uh, very young terrain in the form of Sputnik um, and the flanks of uh, the cryovolcanoes and the bladed terrains that I showed you, all of which are very young. But we also found intermediate age terrains uh, that are of order a billion years old. And so this, in, uh, when you put all of this together, it tells us that Pluto is not uh, an, uh, undergoing an episode of renewed geologic activity today that is atypical. Um, but in fact, it's most likely that Pluto has been geologically active throughout its entire four and a half billion years. And because it is a small planet, as I said, only 2,400 kilometers in diameter, and therefore um, uh, would be expected to cool off rather quickly, this presents a major puzzle and uh, uh, a major finding of the mission uh, as to how that uh, geophysical activity can take place in a small world over so many billions of years uh, and uh, tells us that the other dwarf planets of the Kuiper Belt uh, 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 may as well show uh, modern day geologic activity uh, when we explore them. Uh, and all of this uh, was unexpected uh, uh, and contrary to paradigm before the flyby of Pluto. Um, I don't have time to talk about some of the other major findings, but I at least want to point to them. There are now half a dozen different lines of evidence that speak to the presence of an interior a liquid water ocean inside of Pluto. Um, and we see evidence not only for uh, the presence of that ocean, uh, but we see evidence for uh, 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 
the flooding of some terrains by that water um, through uh, one style of the cryovolcanic processes that we've talked about onto the surface. And most interestingly, um, I think, uh, uh, those flooded regions um, show the infrared spectroscopic signature of organics, which may come from the silting of atmospheric products, but may also come from the ocean itself. And the case is strong enough that this paper led by Dale Cruikshank on our team, uh, uh, actually graced the cover of Astrobiology Magazine last summer. Um, another important finding from New Horizons, um, for the flyby of Pluto, uh, is the, the finding from the, the cratering statistics on the surface of Pluto and its large moon Charon, uh, that the population structure of the impactors, which come from this third zone, the Kuiper Belt, is quite different than we had expected uh, before we were able to image Pluto and recover that information. In fact, there is a dearth, a very strong dearth, of small bodies of scales uh, a few kilometers and smaller uh, compared to prediction. Uh, and in fact, compared to uh, uh, collisional equilibrium. So from the flyby of Pluto, we've not only learned about Pluto and its system of satellites, and by extension, the other dwarf planets in the Kuiper Belt, but also about the population structure of the Kuiper Belt itself, because the, the geologic um, uh, mapping of craters across the surface allows us to see impactors um, down to sizes of literally uh, not just the kilometers, but even sub-kilometer scale. And those bodies are too small to be detected from the Earth. And so we really only had theoretical models of the population size structure at the scale, uh, which we now can anchor uh, in reality from the data of these uh, cratering statistics. And with that, uh, I'm going to leave uh, the Pluto system and very quickly uh, talk to you about the results of the subsequent flyby we made in 2019 of a small Kuiper belt object, not the size of a continent like Pluto, um, but only a few tens of kilometers across, seen here in scale to Chesapeake Bay in the state of Massachusetts in the United States, um, a small body discovered uh, by the Hubble Space Telescope in a search for Kuiper belt objects that we could fly by uh, with New Horizons. We discovered this object in 2014 uh, for those of you familiar with the Rosetta mission and Comet CG, 67P um, CG, uh, you can see this object is um, quite a bit larger, about an order of magnitude larger, three orders of magnitude larger in mass. It's still quite a small object compared to a dwarf planet. We have named it Arakoth, uh, which is a uh, uh, North American Indian uh, word that translates to the sky. Um, and this is Arakoth, as seen by New Horizons in our flyby on the 1st of January. This object is a contact binary. Uh, there are many important discoveries that have been made about its geology. I wanna speak primarily to its origin, uh, but the fact alone that it is a contact binary is a very important clue to that origin. Um, you noticed that the two individual lobes do not show evidence of a violent collision, but instead look like uh, two objects that, oh, that very gently merged. I'll have more to say about that later. I want to tell you that our spectroscopy of the surface of this object um, revealed some inconclusive evidence for water ice, which was widely expected, but which we could not confirm, but which a little bit surprisingly, and only a little bit because um, uh, uh, planetary disks around young stars, uh, and some uh, small bodies in the solar system had also revealed the presence of methanol, which is the predominant molecule seen in our infrared reflectance spectroscopy on the surface of Arakot. The object is very red. You see it here at the top in uh, true color and extended color images. I don't have time to talk about the, uh, uh, the importance of the methanol. Let me just show you in this um, uh, uh, image product created by Roman Tekshenko. Uh, that you can see immediately uh, from different perspectives 
as the flyby took place, that the object uh, does not consist of two spherical lobes, but two very highly flattened lobes, which uh, are represented in the shape model here, and which uh, are not only flattened, but have their principal axes aligned uh, uh, in all three cases uh, to within a matter of degrees, which Monte Carlo models indicate is extremely unlikely, perhaps uh, between a tenth of a percent and one percent, uh, uh, and is much more likely to be the, the signature of um, uh, principal axis alignment due to uh, tidal forces late in the evolution of these two objects as they inspiraled uh, from being an orbiting binary to being a contact binary. Simulations done by members of our team, primarily Derek Richardson and Julian Moronic, using spherical, uh, excuse me, smooth particle uh, hydrodynamic codes, um, have allowed us to constrain the, the velocity of, of the impact uh, to be very slow. Remember, these bodies are only tens of kilometers across, and if you collide them at 10 meters per second, you get a result like you see here, not a, a bound contact binary, uh, but a glancing collision uh, that results uh, in the, the, uh, the two bodies um, escaping from one another. In fact, here's another example um, at five meters per second, whoops, which I can't seem to show you. So I will show you this uh, two and a half meter per second experiment um, that shows a successful simulation of uh, contact binary merger, but only at these very low speeds. Now, the interesting thing and the important thing about this is that there, are, uh, there ha had been two primary theories of how planetesimals, the building blocks of planets, form. One involved objects on disparate heliocentric orbits making high-speed collisions, uh, the other uh, consisting of uh, local particle collapse clouds um, that suffer a gravitational instability. Uh, and all of the evidence that we have from this flyby is that this object formed through the latter mechanism, through uh, a local cloud collapse, which is consistent with the very low speed of the impact, with the homogeneous surface composition and color of the surface of the object, uh, and many of the geological telltales, and is also consistent with the aligned principal axes of the two bodies that we found, in which the, the, um, the local collapse cloud formed the two individual lobes through low speed accretion, and then as the binary hardened due to one of a number of possible processes, including nebular drag, uh, or uh, through ejecting smaller members of uh, the ensemble in uh, orbiting objects within the local collapse cloud. Uh, and uh, they're escaping with angular momentum and energy, allowing the two primary bodies, uh, as I said, to dissipate those quantities. Um, and their orbit shrinks and shrinks, and then they close enough for uh, tidal evolution, which we see the result of, and finally a gentle merger. So this cartoon um, illustrates that, that process um, I refer you to Bill McKinnon's wonderful paper in science, accompanied by two other papers about this object by uh, John Spencer and Will Grundy and a very large team of co-authors in each case. Uh, this is a really wonderful finding and a game-changing finding in planetary science because we had previously been unable to develop uh, really uh, uh, decisive evidence between these two formation models for planetesimals, uh, the older theory that involved disparate heliocentric orbits and uh, binary accretion, and then the, the particle cloud collapse, but Eric Hoff seems to have uh, uh, solved that problem for us. Of course, we wanna see more objects uh, in the Kuiper belt, uh, but the important point that I didn't make is that the Kuiper belt, because it is uh, a very rarefied environment, and because it is so far from the sun and cold, uh, is the best preserved region of the solar system. And therefore, unlike the asteroid belt and other small body populations that contain planetesimals, uh, the planetesimals of the Kuiper belt contain uh, more faithful uh, information about their formation mode than we can get from comets or asteroids. So this seems to be very decisive. As I said before, we would like to see 
uh, more objects to really know that Erkoff was typical. Uh, but this seems to be pointing to the uh, particle cloud collapse streaming instability models very strongly. I don't have time today with only 10 minutes left to tell you about the many other wonderful game-changing findings that we've made with New Horizons at our Jupiter Gravity Assist flyby in the Jovian Magnetosphere, in the satellite system of Pluto that I didn't speak to at all, now in our heliosphere, where we carry uh, uh, instrumentation that's much more sensitive than Voyager was able to carry, or in probing the properties of other Kuiper Belt objects. We have now studied about two dozen KBOs, in addition to Erkoff, uh, uh, not, not uh, with close flybys, but from uh, distant observations that allow us to probe them in ways we can't from the Earth. So New Horizons has uh, just been a spectacular mission for all of us that are involved and has changed our understanding of dwarf planets, of the formation of planetesimals, of the workings of uh, small planets, of the formation of binary uh, planets, of the formation of contact binaries, uh, and, uh, and, and of ocean worlds, and much more. Uh, what next for New Horizons? I'll just say that the mission um, is funded through 2022, and we continue to explore the Kuiper Belt. Uh, we're using large telescopes to look for another flyby target. If we find it, we will redirect the spacecraft to another Kuiper Belt object flyby. If we don't find it, we'll continue to explore the heliosphere and use the spacecraft as an observatory in the Kuiper Belt to probe these small bodies. Uh, and the spacecraft is expected on a fuel and power basis to be able to operate for almost another 20 years. So we expect to operate it out to 90 or 100 astronomical units, its current position being about half that far from the sun. So Tillman, um, I'm gonna conclude there and leave 10 minutes for, for questions, if there are questions. Thank you again. Yeah. For Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alan, for this fascinating talk. I mean, this is truly a game-changing mission, you know? I mean, it's a perfect example for, you think you, you know, have an idea of what you find and then you get there and everything is totally different. I think. You're absolutely right. It's the power of spacecraft exploration. Um, yeah. by, by, by being able to go close, we, we, we find things that we would never be able to do with our technology from Earth. Yeah, I have, I have uh, four questions in, in, the, in, the, um, um, in the question and answer section, but maybe there are raised hands. I mean, so Liva, do you have? Uh... Yeah, we have two raised hands, yeah. But the okay, questions so... were first, so. Okay, so, I mean, there is one question by Patricio Sain. Is there an estimation of the size of the impactor that made the basin where the glaciers, the glaciers lay? Yes, there is. Um, it is estimated that that impactor was of scale one or 200, perhaps 300 kilometers across. And in fact, uh, because uh, those impacts are so rare from the population size frequency distribution of the Kuiper Belt, uh, but were ex are expected to have been much more common in the early days of the solar system, that allows us uh, to say with pretty high confidence that that basin impact must have occurred very early in Pluto's history. Okay, Mario Damora from DLR in Berlin, I think, I mean, says it's a super nice talk and his question basically is, is there a Pluto global infrared data product uh, produced by the mission that he might be interested in? Yes, um, all of the data from the Pluto flyby is now in the NASA planetary data system. All of the data sets of all types, atmospheric, surface, satellites, all of it, plus the cruise science data, the data from the Jupiter flyby, most of the data from the Erkoff flyby is already in the planetary data system. Specific to the question, um, the infrared mapping spectrometer on board New Horizons produced hemispheric maps of the flyby hemisphere at various resolutions, some places at higher resolution than others, but characteristically a few kilometers per pixel uh, across the, the flyby hemisphere um, from 1.25 to 2.5 microns and a spectral resolution of a few hundred. And those uh, uh, data sets are in the PDS, the planetary data system, and the meta products from uh, those data sets that constitute the flyby hemisphere compositional maps are also in the planetary data system. 
Okay, Alexei Golubov uh, asks about the, the source of the internal heat of Pluto uh, needed to support the convection in the glaciers and to prevent the subsurface ocean from freezing. Yes, this is a very good question and the answer is unknown. Um, uh, there are a variety of, of hypotheses. Um, it's possible that uh, 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 radiogenic decay could still be powering this activity such as the, the convection of the glacier, if there was enough radiogenic material uh, in the source region that Pluto was formed from. But it's also possible that other processes are uh, creating uh, that, that heat. Uh, one conjecture I'll just mention very briefly is that the slow freezing of the ocean, which of course releases latent heat, could be acting as a battery to power not only uh, uh, the convective activity, but many other kinds of geology. Uh, that we see on Pluto's surface. Mike McCulloch asks about uh, raw, not modeled trajectory data for new horizons. Uh, he, he wanted to get them, but he couldn't get them apparently. So is there a way to get those data? Yeah, um, uh, you can get simple data by going to uh, the JPL Horizons um, system. You can just Google uh, or otherwise search for J, uh, JPL Horizons, uh, but uh, the SPICE data from uh, uh, our trajectory are also in the planetary data system, and they're freely available to everyone. Steiner, does Pluto have a magnetic field? Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, the answer is unknown. Uh, New Horizons does not carry a magnetometer. Uh, that choice was made uh, because of the limitations of mass and money uh, that, that, you know, there were many instruments we would have liked to have carried that we could not on, on this class of mission. Um, but also uh, because small bodies uh, are not expected uh, to be magnetized, uh, uh, we just took the bet that uh, it was more important to fly other things uh, uh, to understand Pluto. Uh, that said, um, the SWAP instrument, the low energy plasma instrument, um, has produced some uh, uh, indirect data that they've been able to uh, create models and set upper limits on uh, the maximum strength of Pluto's uh, possible magnetic field. Um, we have just finished a NASA study of a follow-up mission to Pluto that would involve an orbiter to stay in the Pluto system and observe time domain effects and map the rest of the surface and carry mass spectrometers and magnetometers, ice penetrating radars and do a, a second generation um, uh, study of the Pluto system. And uh, the magnetometer is, as I said, on the list uh, for that mission if it uh, uh, is, is funded and built. Uh, Saliba, so how are we doing the, with- Tillman, uh, yeah, We have a raised hand, hand from Roger Bonnet. Okay. Okay. Um, please, Professor Bonnet, can you unmute your microphone, please? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for this uh, fantastic uh, expose. It's very remarkable. Uh, in fact, I am uh, Roger Bonnet, former ESA director of science uh, in the uh, in the. The European Space Agency, and I'm very impressed by the mission that you described, especially because it is offering a lot of challenges to somebody like you, and you managed uh, to do it, so congratulations for that. So well, what kind of lessons learned uh, do you think that your mission could be used uh, and could be useful for the future Alan Sturz, uh, who may have in their brain some kind of similar mission to undertake now, and they want to be successful as you have been. Well, thank you, Roger, and thank you for the compliment uh, as well as the question. Um, uh, I think the success of New Horizons is due to many people um, at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, the Southwest Research Institute, at NASA, and with our, with our broader team and our science team, of course. Um, there are many lessons learned um, at a very detailed level, and there are many I would say meta lessons. I will just point to two for lack of time. The first that I would give um, advice uh, regarding is that persistence really pays. Um, it, it was a 17 year effort uh, just to find the funding. 
uh, and then another uh, decade long effort uh, to build and fly this mission. And had we not persisted in the face of uh, cancellations and failed design studies and many other problems, um, we could not have succeeded. So I would give um, future PIs the advice that when, when, uh, when you face defeat, you need to stand back up and try again and again and again and again. If you think it's important, you need to really never let go of, uh, uh, of it and you need to work on it every day. Um, uh, but I would also say that there's a very important lesson uh, in the way that we constructed this mission. And that is that we practiced what I will call appetite control. There were many things we would have liked to have been able to do. We'd have liked to have flown two spacecraft, both for redundancy reasons and to fly by the other side of Pluto. Uh, we would have liked to have flown many types of instrumentation. We would have liked to have many things that we could not afford. And by making intelligent choices, often very difficult choices, um, we were able to stay within the budget and, and actually carry out a mission. And as I said many times to our team, and some of you on this may have heard me say it in other contexts, when I led NASA's space science program, 80% um, uh, of something is much more valuable than 100% of nothing. And it's only by making those hard choices that we were actually able, but by making those compromises that we could carry out this expedition and deliver this fantastic new knowledge about our solar system. I probably Hello, only have time for one question. I'm due one to leave more question. right now, okay. and they are calling my phone. <laughs> okay, so the next one is from Andrew Ball. Uh, are there formation theories for Pluto that we read about in our school textbooks that can now be ruled out as a result of the New Horizons mission? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, I think that we had a very good understanding of the basic formation of the binary planet um, long before the New Horizons flyby. Uh, and that, that came from various kinds of information, um, the, the mass ratio of the binary, the specific angular momentum in the binary, uh, the details uh, of the uh, orbits of the small satellites, et cetera. Um, and so we really understood that pretty well. And everything that we have learned in the New Horizons flyby uh, confirmed that, that paradigm. Uh, and so I would say that, uh, that our primary contribution to understanding origins uh, uh, occurred at ERCA in seeing the contact binary and by coming to understand the many facets of that body that lead us to the conclusion that streaming instabilities and local cloud collapse um, was the, the important formation mechanism for, uh, for planetesimals. Okay, uh, we have more questions. I don't know if we can forward them to you so we can answer them later. I, I don't know if that can be done, Saliba, but... Uh, yeah, sure, um, sure. I'm gonna be in, a, in an all day meeting, so don't expect the answers oh, okay. <laughs> to come out. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much anyway. I mean, this has been fascinating and uh, I'll give you a great hand. I, I don't know how to do that on, on Zoom, but if we were here, uh, you know, in an audience, in a, in a lecture hall, I would give you a great hand. You had over 240, an audience of over 240. That, that was fantastic. quite fantastic. Okay. Um, thank you very much for those who attended this, uh, this seminar. Um, just to water your mouth, you know, for next week's talk. So next week, uh, uh, Thursday at 1700 uh, Central European time, Ralph Yalman, PI of the High Resolution Stereo Camera, will speak about the Mars Express mission. And then the week thereafter, we will have a talk about the Venus Express mission by Anne Van Dale from um, Belgium. Okay, uh, looking forward to seeing you again next week and uh, have a good week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.